What's going on, family? I'm Scrapbook Boxing, Museum of the Forgotten Fisticuff Series. In this video, I will, in my opinion, be listing 10 greatest black heavyweights of all times. Historically, you had some great ones. But I'll be mentioning 10 great black heavyweights of all times. In a separate video, I'll do the same. For the light heavyweight division, the middleweight division, welterweight, lightweight, and featherweight divisions, and perhaps the bantamweight division as well. Now, beginning with Peter Jackson, the Black Prince, some know him as Peter the Great, I will be discussing these fighters once again in no specific order. But Peter Jackson, who was born in St. Croix, Virgin Islands, 1861, he would become the Australian heavyweight champion in 1886 when he would defeat Tommy Lee. In 1888, he would arrive in the United States and he would knock out in 19 rounds the then colored heavyweight champion, Old Chocolate, George Godfrey. Oh, that fight with something else and how that fight came about. With George Godfrey would challenge the bare knuckle champion, the Boston strong boy, John O'Sullivan. In fact, he challenged him several times. John O'Sullivan would become the bare knuckle champion in 1882 when he would defeat Patty Ryan. An old chocolate, George Godfrey, got wind that John O'Sullivan would walk around Boston claiming that he would whip any son of a bitch in the house. And he wanted that smoke. He wanted the opportunity. But once John O'Sullivan became champion, he immediately crossed the color line. And he stated that he would never fight a black fighter. I never will and never shall. So Old Chocolate, George Godfrey was left to face Peter Jackson. And that fight went 19 rounds. Oh, unfortunately for Old Chocolate, Peter Jackson would get the best of him. And he would stop him in 19 rounds. And this is what John O'Sullivan was afraid of. So a young man by the name of General Jim Corbett, who was a banker, San Francisco got wind of an opportunity after facing Joe Chowinski a few times. He thought he could fight John O'Sullivan, but he had to get past Peter Jackson. Now, as I stated, John O'Sullivan had already crossed the color line. Those who were there knew that Peter Jackson would never get a shot at John O'Sullivan's title. The fight went 61 rounds. First, it was called a no contest, but those members of the audience was outraged. So they changed it to a draw. And this would allow Jim Corbett the opportunity to face John O'Sullivan, 1892, September 7th to be exact, at the Carnival of Champions, New Orleans, Louisiana. John O'Sullivan was knocked out in 21 rounds. It would be the last bare knuckle, first glove championship fight. They would wear five ounce gloves. It was winner take all. Gentleman Jim Corbett would take all the money and the belt. And Peter Jackson was left out in the cold. But that same year in 1892, he would become the British Empire heavyweight champion in London. He would die in Roma, Queensland, Australia. July 13th, 1901. He was just 40 years of age at the time of his death. He would have three losses, five draws, one no decision and one no contest. Peter Jackson, one of the greatest heavyweights who never got an opportunity to fight for the established title. Those who knew Peter Jackson knew how great he was. And when James J. Corbett had called the quits, he stated, that Peter Jackson 
was the greatest fighter that he had ever faced. And those who dared to give him an opportunity would lose their title. And that's funny because Corbett, after defeating John O'Sullivan, never gave Peter Jackson a shot. Instead, he would give that shot to Bob Fitzsimmons. And he'd be stopped in 14 rounds with a solar plexus shot in Carson City, Nevada. Peter Jackson, Peter the Great, what a hell of a fighter. And he is on my list of 10 great black heavyweights in boxing history. Shout out to Peter Jackson. Now the next fighter on my list, once again in no specific order, is the Boston Bone Crusher, Sam Langford. He was born 1886 in Weymouth Falls, Digsby County, Nova Scotia, Canada. He died January 12, 1956. He would reside in Boston, Massachusetts. Now Sam Langford stood five foot seven inches. Some would say five foot six and three quarter inches. He would have a 74 inch reach. He was a featherweight, lightweight, welterweight, middleweight, as well as heavyweight. He had a record of 256 total bouts according to record, 180 wins, 128 knockouts, 29 losses, 39 draws, and he must have had at least 200 no decision contests, newspaper decisions, because Sam Langford would fight in backwoods, barns, wherever he can fight. And a lot of them were off record. But he would face the first black lightweight champion, December 8, 1903, Joe Gans. The fight would go 15 rounds. He would defeat Joe Gans. But the title was not on the line because of a weight disparity. He would fight the first black welterweight champion in the Barbados Demon, Joe Walcott, November 5, 1904. And once again, that fight went 15 rounds. But it was a draw. And it was peer range where the title would not be on the line. He would face the first black light heavyweight champion. The color light heavyweight champion. Lee Anderson and Kid Norfolk. Both these men were outstanding fighters. William Ward was a dynamite puncher. He would fight the first black middleweight champion, Theodore Tiger Flowers, the Georgia Deacon, 1922. Now Tiger Flowers would become the first black middleweight champion in 1926 when he would defeat Harry Greb in New York's Madison Square Garden. But Sam Langford would face him in 1922. He would stop him in two rounds. And Tiger Flowers was a young man. Sam Langford would be in a ring with a Dixie kid who was a welterweight champion, battling Jim Johnson, who he faced 15 times, Klondike Haynes, and Jeff Clark, the Joplin Ghost. He'd be in a ring with Bill Tate and George Godfrey, Leaperville Shadow. Both these men would become the colored heavyweight champion. He'd be in a ring with Philadelphia Jack O'Brien, August 15, 1911. He would stop him in six rounds. And Jack O'Brien was once a light heavyweight champion. He would lose his title to the Giant Killer. And Giant Killer was a very good fighter himself. His name was Jack Dillon. Sam Langford would be in a ring with Stanley Ketchell, April 27, 1910. Stanley Ketchell was a middleweight champion of the world. And it was a six round, no decision contest, peer arranged. But Sam Langford was promised by Stanley Ketchell, that he would fight him for the middleweight championship title. Unfortunately for Stanley Ketchell, he'd be shot and killed by Walter Dipley. Sam Langford would become the colored middleweight champion November 12, 1907, when he would take on young Peter Jackson. He would face young Peter Jackson six separate occasions, and he would defeat him by knocking him out. He would also take on Joe Jeanette, for the World Colored Heavyweight Champion. Be in the ring with Joe Jeanette several times. Joe Jeanette was known as the Iron Man. And he was a hell of a fighter. Be in the ring with Jack Johnson, 
for the World Colored Heavyweight Championship. You be in the ring with Sam McVeigh for the World Colored Heavyweight Championship. Face him 15 times. He would face Harry Wills for the Colored Heavyweight Championship. He would face Harry Wills 22 times. You see, Sam Langford would be a five-time heavyweight champion. A one-time colored middleweight champion. So he was a five-time colored heavyweight champion. I want to make that clear. He was a one-time colored middleweight champion. He was a one-time colored middle, uh, European middleweight champion. Excuse me. He was a one-time Mexican and a one-time Australian heavyweight champion. He was an outstanding fighter. Much avoided. No one wanted to face Sam Langford. The Sullivan Brothers. Jack Dempsey. Gene Tunney. Marvin Hart. They were all challenged by Sam Langford. And they all denied Sam Langford of an opportunity. When the light heavyweight championship division was created in 1903, Jack Root was the middleweight contender. And he moved up to the light heavyweight and challenged George Gardner. After defeating Charles Kid McCoy and George Gardner would defeat Marvin Hart, Sam Langford was not invited to that tournament. He was deliberately frozen out because they all knew what Sam Langford possessed. Sam Langford, my opinion, was the most avoided fighter in boxing history outside of Charlie Burley. I have him ranked number one, the greatest fighter of all times. He most definitely had to be on his list of 10 great black heavyweight fighters of all times. Shout out to Sam Langford, Boston Bone Crusher. Oh, what a fighter he was. Now the next fighter is Sam McVeigh. He was known as the Oxnard Cyclone. He stood five foot ten and a half inches, had a 75 inch reach. He fought from 1902 to 1921, had a total bout career of 102 fights, 76 wins, 13 losses, 62 knockouts, and he was stopped five times himself. He faced Sam Langford 15 times, battling Jim Johnson seven times, Harry Wills five times, Jack Johnson three times. He was in a ring with Jeff Clark, the Joplin Ghost, and Jack Thompson. And he would face Joe Jeanette three times in 1909 alone. I don't know who does that, but Joe Jeanette, the Iron Man from Hoboken, New Jersey. Sam McVay would face him February 20th for the vacant colored heavyweight championship crown. You see, Jack Johnson would become the first black heavyweight champion when he would defeat Noah Brusso, Tommy Burns in 1908 in Sydney, Australia. He would stop him in 14 rounds. They would cut off the camera because they did not want to see a white fighter stopped by a black fighter. So since that title was vacant, Jack Johnson would appoint Sam McVeigh and Joe Jeanette for that crown. Sam Langford was left out deliberately. April 17, 1909, Sam McVeigh would lose his heavyweight championship crown, the colored belt, if you will. 49 rounds of brutal hell, in my opinion, was the greatest heavyweight championship contest in boxing history. The fight is not often talked about, but it had all the elements, and it was brought out by both fighters. And that shows you the testament of the man. Neither man could breathe. Neither man could see. There were cuts and lacerations. And these men were exhausted. They were on their second and third win. They got to a point where Sam McVeigh had to be given a paper bag in order to breathe. They had to pour a complete bucket of water over Joe Jeanette's head just to revive him. Sam McVeigh could not continue. That was one of the greatest fights, if not the greatest fight of all times. December 11th, 1909. After all those brutal fights with one another, 
they would face one another once again. This time a 30 round draw. All in Paris, France. Sam McVeigh and Joe Jeanette will live together like Ali and Joe Frazier. Name by name. You can't name one without the other. Sam McVeigh, the Oxnard Cyclone. What a hell of a fighter he was. And he is, without a doubt, on this list of 10 greatest black heavyweights of all times. Oh, what a fighter. What a puncher this man was. He knocked out everybody. What a hell of a fighter. Now, Joe Jeanette, the Iron Man of Hoboken, is definitely on this list of 10 greatest black heavyweights of all times. He stood 5 foot 10 inches, had a 74 inch reach. He had a total bout career of 104 fights, 83 wins, 10 losses, 69 knockouts, 10 draws, and he was stopped twice. He fought from November 11th, 1904 to June 1st, 1922. He would win the Colored Heavyweight Championship crown. And he faced Sam Langford 14 times. Sam McVeigh took the great black fighters such as Jack Johnson several times. He took on Kid Norfolk twice. Battling Jim Johnson eight times. George Kid Cotton, George Coles, Jeff Clark, the Joplin Ghost 11 times. Cleve Hawkins. He faced John Lester Johnson and Bill Tate. Harry Wills twice, and Black Bill. What a fighter Joe Jeanette was. He was entered in the Boxing Hall of Fame in 1967, along with the great Sugar Ray Robinson and Barney Young Allen, who was a lightweight and welterweight. Shout out to Joe Jeanette, the Iron Man of Hoboken. Has a street name after him. Shows you what a fighter he was. Galveston Giant, Jack Johnson, was born March 31st, 1878 in Galveston, Texas. He weighed 195 pounds and stood six foot, one and three quarter inches. And Jack Johnson would fight 1897 with Jim Rocks, and he would defeat Sam Smith in 10 rounds. And Jack Johnson fought everybody. He was in the ring with Jack Jeffries, who was the brother of Jim Jeffries, and he would stop him. 1903, February 5th to be exact, he would defeat Denver Ed Martin in Los Angeles, California. He would defeat him in 20 rounds for the colored heavyweight championship strap. And he would take on Black Bill, Joe Jeanette, several times. And he would be in the ring with Joe Grimm and Fireman Jim Flynn, young Peter Jackson. He would face Sam Langford. 1906, April 26 to be exact. And he would defeat him in 15 rounds. Now he weighed 187 pounds. And Sam Langford weighed at least 156 pounds, 57 pounds. I know it was a 20 pound gap between the two. Sam Langford was about 20 years old. Jack Johnson would knock down Sam Langford a few times. What had happened during my research that Sam Langford, two weeks prior, taking on the Iron Man from Hoboken. Joe Jeanette. It went the distance. But Sam Langford would defeat Joe Jeanette. But he was spraying his hand. And two weeks later, he was in a ring with the colored heavyweight champion, Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson had promised Sam Langford a second opportunity, which Sam Langford would never get. But Jack Johnson would become the heavyweight champion in 1908 when he would defeat Noah Brusso, Tommy Burns. 
and he was the first black heavyweight champion in boxing history. He would take on Stanley Ketchell, who was the middleweight champion. He knocked him out. He took on Jim Jeffries, the boiler maker, who was a former heavyweight champion, and he knocked him out in 15 rounds. Had it not been for the heckling and the N-word being used several times by the former heavyweight champion, Jim Corbin, Jack Johnson would have spared Jim Jeffries the knockout. But he kept asking him what was his name, as Ali did with Ernie Terrell. He said to Jim Jeffries, is that all you have, Mr. Jeffries? And he was communicating with Jim Corbett as he was pummeling Jim Jeffries. Jim Corbett was in the corner. This fight took place July 4th, 1910 in Reno, Nevada. And after that fight, it seemed like the whole country went to hell. Little black boys were beaten, beaten, half to death. Men were hanging. There were riots, cars being overturned. Homes were burnt on fire because they could not accept the black heavyweight champion, Jack Johnson, defeating a once former heavyweight champion, the boiler maker, Jim Jeffries. Jack Johnson would lose in 26 rounds in 1915, Cuba, Havana, to Jess Willard. And his life would be ended, unfortunately, in 1946. They say he was on his way to see a Billy Kahn, Joe Lewis fight. He seemed to be upset because he wasn't served properly in a cafe. And he would speed off, according to onlookers. And he would turn the curve and fall off a cliff. But there were many who didn't like Jack Johnson. But Jack Johnson would be on the list of 10 greatest black heavyweights of all times. Shout out to Jack Johnson. What an outstanding fighter he was. The next black heavyweight that is on this list is the Harry Wills, the Brown Panther. Born May 15, 1889, New Orleans, Louisiana. He would face Joe Jeanette and Sam Langford 22 times. Sam McVeigh, who was known as the Oxnard Cyclone. Jeff Clark, the Joplin Ghost. Then Red Martin and Kid Norfolk, better known as William Wood. Jeff Thompson, Big Bill Tate. James Tut Jackson. What a fighter Harry Wills was. The unfortunate thing with Harry Wills and why he... It's not talked about as often as he should. He did not get the opportunity of an agreement that he signed with Jack Dempsey in 1924. And Jack Dempsey would renege on that contract. And for that reason, Jack Dempsey would be forced out of New York. But that didn't help Harry Wills. Harry Wills would be blackballed. He was avoided. But he had a brilliant career and retirement. He would own many apartment buildings in Harlem, New York. Harry Wills is most notably known for facing Sam Langford 22 times. What a great fighter Harry Wills was. And he's on this list as one of 10 greatest black heavyweights of all times. Now, one name I just want to mention who is not on this list, and his name was George Godfrey, the Leaperville Shadow. He's worthy. But out of 10 fighters, I could not select him. He was in a ring with fighters. Obi Walker, Al Gaynor from Canada. You also had some other outstanding heavyweights that were outstanding fighters. Elmer Violin Ray, who fought Obi Walker 14 times. But I just wanted to shout out George Goffrey, the Leaperville Shadow. Now, perhaps one final name on this list, on this video, I may have to do a part two, is the Brown Bomber, Joe Lewis. His name was Joseph Lewis Barrow. He was managed by John Roxbell of Chicago, Julian Black, who was a numbers runner. He was trained by Jack Blackburn and then Manny Seaman. He was born May 13, 1914 in Lafayette, Alabama. He died April 12, 1981 in Las Vegas, Nevada. 
He was 66 years of age at the time of his death and he would reside in Las Vegas, Nevada. He would suffer from a heart attack. Stood at six foot two inches. Weighed 190 to 112, or 20, I'm sorry, 190 to 202 pounds. He had a 76 inch reach. June 2nd, 1934, he was in the ring with Jack Cracklin. And he fought up until 1951. His last opponent was the Brockton Blockbuster, Rocky Marciano. June 22nd, 1937, he would find himself in the ring with James J. Braddock, being the second black heavyweight champion in boxing history. He faced Braddock in Comiskey Park, knocking him out in eight rounds. One minute and ten seconds of the eighth round in front of 45,500 spectators. They grossed $103,684. And what was amazing about Joe Lewis? His punching power was amazing. He had a total bar career of 69 fights, 66 wins, 52 knockouts, three losses, and he was stopped twice. Once against Max Schmeling and once against Rocky Marciano. Former champions that he would be in the ring with. Primo Carnera, June 25, 1935 in New York's Madison Square Garden. Max Baer, September 24, 1935, New York's Yankee Stadium. Jack Sharkey, August 18, 1936, New York's Yankee Stadium. Jim Braddock, June 22, 1937, Comiskey Park in Chicago. Max Schmeling, June 19, 1936, New York's Yankee Stadium. Faced him again, June 22, 1938, in, in uh, Yankee Stadium. He was in the ring with Billy Kahn, June 18, 1941, New York's Polo Grounds. June 19th, 1946, in New Jersey. Uh, he was in the ring with Jersey Joe Walcott, December 5th, 1947, New York's Madison Square Garden, June 25th, 1948. He was in the ring with Ezra Charles, September 27th, 1950, at New York's Yankee Stadium. Rocky Marciano, October 26th, 1951, in New York's Madison Square Garden. 1993, he had a stamp that was named after him. He had 22 world championship bouts, 20 by knockout. Unbelievable fighter was Joe Lewis. I'm Scrapbook Boxing, Museum of the Forgotten Fistico Series. All great fights, all great fighters will never be forgotten on my channel. Now the last fighter on this video, 10 greatest black heavyweights of all times. Is Cassius Marcellus Clay, Muhammad Ali, from Louisville, Kentucky. Born Louisville, Kentucky, January 17, 1942. He stood six foot two and a half inches. He was in a 1960 National AAU Light Heavyweight Championships. The 1960 National Golden Gloves Heavyweight Championships. 1960 Olympic Light Heavyweight Champion. And he was a three time heavyweight champion. 1964, he would defeat Charles Sonny Liston. Defeat him in seven rounds. Miami Beach, Florida. The following year, 1965, he would defeat him in Lewiston, Maine, stopping him in one round. March 8th, 1971, he would face Joe Frazier in New York's Madison Square Garden. It was for the World Heavyweight Championship. He would lose that time. You see, Muhammad Ali was stripped of his title because of his religious beliefs. And they used the draft to take away his passport. And they didn't allow him to fight anymore for three years. He was a conscientious objective. 1967, he was exiled from boxing, refusing to be drafted into the U.S. Army. 1974. He regained his championship by knocking out George Foreman. 1978, he would lose to the novice. 1976, gold medal champion, Leon Spinks. Later that year, he would regain that title. He would become the third a three-time heavyweight champion. He would have a record of 61 fights, 56 wins and five losses. 
This is basically in his career. After the Larry Holmes fight in 1980, he would take on one more fighter, Trevor Burbick in 1981. It would be known as the Drama in Bahama. Something to that effect. Being in the room with Kenny Norton, Ernie Shavers, Bob Foster. He would take on Ron Lyle and Henry Cooper, Ernie Terrell, and Zora Foley, Alvin Blue Lewis, George Cavallo, Jerry Quarry, and Ringo Bona Oscarvena. Muhammad Ali, many name him the greatest of all times. Perhaps he was. Thanks for watching. Scrapbook Boxing, Museum of the Forgotten Fist of Series. All great fights, all great fighters will never be forgotten on my channel. Ten greatest black heavyweights of all times. Peace.